Our next speaker in this room is Scott Beaver from uh, Western Oregon University, speaking today on reflections on a self-paced complex analysis course. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, that's right, I'm Scott Beaver from Western Oregon. We're a little teacher's college of about 6,000 students uh, in the Willamette Valley. And um, the complex analysis course that I taught this past spring, um, there were eight students in it. and. Uh, I had taught it three times previous and I wanted to do something different, um, something a little bit more towards IBL, more towards more method, but I wasn't exactly sure what. Um, so as I began thinking about it, I sort of broke it down um, all the way back to sort of square zero. Um, I mean, how do we deliver content? Well, we do it in class and we have a couple of ways we can do that in class and then we can do it outside of class office hours or assigning homework. Those are self-evident truths I think we can all agree on. Um, maybe this is a little bit more of a bold statement, but uh, I suppose the next thing that I thought about was, all right, well, how am I going to be able to maximize what they're getting out of the class, basically? And of course, there are eight students in there, which means there are probably 16 different opinions on how that could be done. Um, so these three bullet points, they really say uh, nothing effectively. But the bottom part, there is one thing that I, I think most of us here, if not everyone, will agree that uh, the more active work they do, meaning um, the more problem solving that they do or the more active reading, the more output that comes out of their brain, the better off they are, the more learning that happens, uh, at least loosely speaking, but, but probably a little more strongly than loosely. Um, I am going to use the word lecture a few times during this talk um, just because I'm not sure it, it's been used at any point in the conference so far. So, um, but I, I don't really like lecture. Just let me make that clear right from the start. But it does have some positive things and we shouldn't just blow by them. Um, students, if the, if the professor does a good job, the students get to see what the professor will expect of them in the form of a worked out solution or a solved proof. Sure, we get that. Um, we also speak faster than we write, so as we sort of chatter on and we're writing our theorems down, sometimes we'll say things that are equally me or perhaps even more meaningful than the things we're writing down. We can provide additional insight, that's certainly true. Um, and if, from a little broader perspective, um, the more aware students may gain an appreciation for the beauty of a subject as, as it's laid out in front of them um, in a, a, a linear, uh, a nice way. So that's a, sort of some of the pros of lecture. There are plenty of cons. I don't really have to go over all of them, but um, certainly uh, the fact that you have to write down uh, as fast as the professor is writing can, can cause uh, temp temporal tremors that propagate through the lecture and can make a mess of what uh, uh, comes afterwards. Um, the second one I think is, is really the fundamental problem that a lot of folks have with lecture and that is um, in a lecture environment students aren't necessarily um, immersed in a culture where they're encouraged to think really deeply or carefully about things that they're often uh, taught to think, maybe not intentionally, but they're often led to to think about problems, even proofs, algorithmically. And, and that's not, uh, in my humble opinion, that, that's not something I really want my students to do, to think too algorithmically. I would rather have, have them think more deeply about the fundamental concepts. Also, of course, students um, in a lecture course, they're a little more passive. and They, they use 5,000-year-old technology of transcribing their class notes onto papyrus and then later they take it back and take a homework problem and project that onto the space of things they just wrote down and try to find the least square solution and turn something in for at least uh, some extra credit. And of course there's the embarrassment thing which actually can come from at least two different places. Students might be embarrassed, uh, embarrassed if they think uh, they're asking a stupid question or if they think the other students will think that they're a geek for even bothering to ask the question in the class. So um, there's that consideration as well. Now sort of the opposite end of when I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, 
what I was going to do in this class is, is the paradigm of the office hour, which we'll assume for the purposes of now it's one-on-one -on -one instruction or one-on-one -on -one discussion at least with a student. Um, I, I can't envision a scenario where you could be any more efficient than one-on-one -on -one with a single student. Um, and it, it offers an opportunity for the professor to focus very precisely on what a, a given student's individual needs are um, and, and guide them. You know, of course you can just answer their questions, but that's not as much fun as, you know, sort of dragging them along until they finally, the light bulb goes off and that last leading question gets them there, or at least leaves them with some idea that they'll, they'll hit on later. Uh, but of course office hours have their limitations too, uh, specifically temporally, we, we don't have 25 office hours a week, so we, we can't expect every student to be able to attend everyone. Even if they did, we would be overrun with students. Um, and I suspect there are more than one of us here that uh, when we were students and we went into our uh, professor's offices, we probably felt a little intimidated too. So there's that factor to be cognizant of as well. Um, so based on the pros and cons of office and, and lecture, uh, I'll put forth the plausible hypothesis that the average learning rate is probably a little higher during office hours than during lectures. So in the process of me trying to decide what I'm going to do with this complex analysis course, I went with that statement. Um, to come back to the course itself, this was a, a very strange mix of students. It was uniform. There are two or three students who are going to go to grad school, two or three distinctly average students, and two or three who barely made the prerequisites and, and who were not marked from success from the beginning. Uh, and I wanted to try to get all of them through. It was an, it's an elective course uh, for a couple. It was their last elective before graduation, so I didn't want to have to make a hard choice, which I made it clear to them I'd be perfectly willing to make, but I, still I didn't want to have to make it. Um, so uh, there's another thing about complex, uh, and I've only taught it th four times now, but but it has a strange mix of material in the sense that um, it's not quite as definition, theorem, proof as, say, real analysis is. Uh, and, and some of the more um, technical proofs in complex tend to detract from the beauty of the complex mathematics itself, in my opinion. So I don't like to just theorem, defini definition, theorem, proof my way through this stuff. Um, and so that's a consideration as well. Um, yeah, that, and that, that's basically on this slide here. I, I, it's not quite, in my experience, it didn't seem like it would be a perfect fit for an inquiry-based learning the way I feel like uh, an advanced calc or a topology is, is more of a perfect fit. Um, and I was concerned for sure about the uh, below average students uh, being able to get through it. And of course the pro, I mean we, we all are aware of this, good motivated students are not going to have trouble um, the way we think of trouble in uh, an inquiry-based learning or a more method class. They tend to thrive in those environments, so I wasn't too worried about those. The, the, so after distilling all that down, I, I decided to use these as sort of the axioms with which I would go forward to design the class and that I was going to get rid of um, much of the lecture but not all of it and I was going to move it out of class time and onto some recording medium. Uh, the second thing, I was going to make sure that I had enough discovery method for the several students that had just finished Advanced Calc 2 with me so that they could continue in that same vein um, through uh, the complex class. Uh, and of course, a uh, several others are going to take Advanced Calc with me next year and I wanted to keep them, um, uh, keep their mathematical maturity going. I want to sneak in some point set topology because we don't have that as a regular offered class and that's just a crying shame. So I, I needed to make sure we got some point set in and uh, we managed to do that. I wanted to eliminate the homework portion of the grades but not the, the homework itself. The homework was going to be just the preparation for the exams and I wanted to maximize uh, students' chances to interact with uh, themselves and the material and myself as well. So. Um, what I came up with was I would record, first I recorded videos and, and then that became uh, a little cumbersome and then I went to pencasts, um, more or less in the spirit of the Khan Academy. Uh, you know, that's not the greatest thing on earth, but it's a pretty neat uh, paradigm and so I copied some of what they do there. Um, I emphasize that you better be putting three or more hours outside of class and now maybe one of those is also looking at lecture but it's really like a, maybe a shorter lecture looked at a few times. 
Uh, and class time was an in-class office hour. That was basically the entire idea of it. Um, and the exams, they were the high stakes. That, that's what the whole class was, was your, your two exams and a final. Um, I started out using uh, filming uh, lectures and linking them from uh, my web page and that was I think glacially slow is, is too rapid a term for it I think it's geologically slow is probably more close to what it was uh, so then I hooked up with our AV department and uh, WUTV converted some things and and they they uh, were able to set it up so it would stream um, but I don't I don't really want to see myself now I've discovered so so um, now I use this thing called a live scribe pen and it's a really terrific tool. I'm not trying to sell any of them. I don't care if I buy them or borrow them. But what they do is they, they record your voice and they uh, write down what you write on something that's more like a PDF with voice. And it's a really terrific tool um, and in, in fact I have linked here uh, one of the lectures. Hopefully it'll just pop right up here. Um, full screen. So yeah, I'll just pick somewhere. I mean, you're not going to listen to very much of this, but this is what it does. It records my voice while I'm scratching out these cryptic symbols on the board. It also has these grayed here so you can sort of anticipate what's coming. That was, that, and in the future, that's going to be the subject of, of some of the notes that I give my students. They're going to be auditory and um, um, visual as well. So let's uh, quit on that for the moment. I'm going to take too much time on there. Um, <coughs> what I liked about this was that students could um, go through this material at their own rate. This allows them to fast forward through stuff they're already completely comfortable with. They'll pause and oscillate back and forth around material they're uncomfortable with. They can pause and eat lunch. Uh, as long as they get it done before class, and that was that's the main thing that um, that I try to do is get them to do it before class. Um, since it was in class office hours, questions were the norm. So so although there was some embarrassment in the first week or two from a few of the students, that went away quickly because that was the whole class. They're just asking questions, and I was asking uh, them questions back, basically to try to get them to think about it. Um, so there were a few things that um, I'm um, going to do a little bit differently, which I will do this fall. I'm going to do advanced calc one and two this way as an experiment. I've done that through modified Moore method for four years, but I'm going to take a break from that for one year and, and try this um, with a little more enforcement of the making sure that they come to class prepared by giving an in-class quiz and maybe not letting them sit in class if they're not prepared. I don't know. I want to make sure they're, they, they're uh, in class and ready to contribute. So I haven't quite worked out what the penalty for that will be, but there should be something. Um, I have a tendency to blather on, so my pen cast could be an hour and ten minutes. And of course they can pause and stop at any time they want, so why I need to make them short, I don't know, but, but that's what my wife Cheryl, who's also a mathematician, told me I should do. And I don't see any reason to disagree with it, so uh, shorter little pen cast, Everybody's attention span is short. Everybody will be happy. Um, and in class, I didn't um, really, I let them self-select or work alone. And I think what I'm going to do in the fall is one day, I'm going to make sure nobody works with anybody. Next day, pick some dyads. Next day, some triads. And then self-select on another day. And then try to get some data on how well they perceive um, that working out for each of them, just for my own curiosity, at least in the first term, maybe not in the second term. The material in Advanced Calc 2 is a little uh, too hard to fool around with, so we might have something standardized by them by that point. And definitely not self-paced. No, self-paced allows the students to let off the gas um, and and I thought it would be a good idea. You got students in ring theory, senior project, they're all very busy. Uh, but the fact was they, they all collectively conspired to let off the gas in about week seven and we didn't get as far as I'd like to go. Part of that was stuff in the topology and took a little longer than I thought, but part of it was definitely um, them just uh, 
easing up right at the end there. So, and, and then the other thing is, I don't want to just get rid of completely the self-paced part because I do want to allow the talented students to blast through it if they can. M maybe none will, but uh, I want to try to allow for that possibility. So I haven't worked that out yet either. We're going to figure it out sometime over the summer. Um, so I will do it again, uh, as I said, and if, if I'm lucky enough to get to come uh, to this conference again and give a talk like this, I'll tell you exactly what happened in the, in the two terms of advanced calc. Um, when uh, we offer it next time. So anyway, the, to summarize, um, it worked. I think it worked well. Uh, there's a uh, cause to, to try a little larger scale um, version of it, which I'll do in this, in this fall. And um, really, it's just the answer to, to the, you know, these two questions at the end are what makes me pretty happy about this. I mean, if you had been able to rewind and listen again to what your professor had just said, that seems like that would be a benefit as long as it wasn't too cumbersome. And if your professor suddenly had a whole bunch more office hours dedicated to just your own class, that would be a pretty, pretty big benefit too. So two fairly good upsides to this. So anyway, there's my contact information. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Are there any questions? Microphone over to you. Uh, why use these? Uh, what did you call these? Uh, live scribe pen, pen casts. Why why use pen casts instead of just assigning a reading from a book? I could just assign. I could just assign a reading from the book. But for the, um, so. It allows me the ability to put a little narrative in there. I don't want to put so much that I want to take away their chances for too many aha light bulb moments. But I want to put a little narrative in there for the students who are average or below average so they can get a little more out of it rather than just, because I could, I picked up plenty of stuff and posted it. And you know they, they read it or whatever. But uh, if I also think if they're listening, it might make them a little more engaged. So Thank we'll you. see how it goes this coming year. Yeah. Any other questions? This is just uh, curious about, do you allow students usually in your class to write while you are writing or talking? Like, I, I figured it out, like some of them when they write, they don't concentrate. Like if you want to connect concepts together, try to do on the board. And most of the time I ask them not to write, but they don't like it. It's just whenever the professor starts to talk, they just start to write. And right. I try it many times, tell them not to write. Let's just try to understand it. Even I promise to give them time to write. They just don't. Uh, have you tried something like, you know, not to the, ask them not to write, or is it useful? Or I, I have not. The, the first abstract algebra course that I took in graduate school, my professor said the same thing to me. Don't write, just listen. And I was horrified at the prospect of not being able to refer back to my notes. You know, I would lose some of this knowledge because I didn't have the confidence that I could reconstruct from, you know, um, what Professor Kim said. Uh, so I haven't asked them not to write. W when I've done the Moore method uh, in advanced calc in the past, I've asked them not to write when the students are presenting, but not when I'm when I'm talking. And I've done so little lecturing in that class that for that particular class, it almost it almost doesn't matter. But I haven't asked the, my calc my freshman calculus students to not write. I don't. I, I think they'd have a fit. I don't think they would be able to to internalize why that would even be reasonable. But I, I see what your point is here. My students, and it was because I asked them to do this, they started taking pictures of the board <laughs> with their cell phones or their yeah. iPads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think and then they've stopped writing so much because of that. And I think it's great. Yeah, I think it is too. Because it takes no time to write. You don't have to think. Oh, is it my idea? I mean, you don't have to think while you're taking a picture, but you have to think while you're writing, and you can't think and internalize at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, if there are any other questions for our speaker, um, for the sake of time, would you find him a little bit later or tomorrow? And let's thank him one last time. Thank you.